Cool. Thanks. <laughs> uh, awesome. Uh, very happy to be here. Actually, I, I moved to Boston almost four years ago, so Vsauce hasn't happened since I've actually been here. So this is uh, this is great. Uh, well done on, on Patrick Levy's part and, and the whole crew for Vsauce. And thanks, most definitely thanks for uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so welcome to my session. Uh, this is called uh, pushing the sock pushing the sock left to achieve Nash equilibrium. Uh, but quick rundown. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a quick rundown. Of, I'll do a quick introduction for myself and walk through the three stages of the talk. Uh, and then we'll take questions at the end. So if you have any questions just yet, please save those towards the end. Uh, I tend to talk kind of fast. So especially if you know me, I talk very fast, actually. That's, that was being modest. But uh, I, I purposely, you know, put in a lot of effort to ensure we at least have 10 minutes of uh, questions. Uh, cool. So who am I? Uh, yeah, like I said, my name is O'Shea Bowens. Uh, I've spent the majority of my career uh, operating in security operations, or uh, if you have the government uh, background, CND, computer network defense. So most of what I do is security analytics, architecture, incident response, threat hunting, intel, all the fun stuff. Pretty much almost anything that isn't pen testing, actually. That's a good way of putting it. Uh, if you're in, uh, I'm, lo I'm located in Boston. Uh, but if you're in the Boston area, you can typically find me around uh, uh, the Boston Security Meetup, uh, which is every third Thursday of the month, ISSA. Uh, I'm also the director of training for Blacks and Cyber, and also you can find me around the, uh, the DEF CON, uh, the Boston DEF CON group, DC 617. Sweet. So why this title? Why did this weirdo go with that title? Uh, when I think about, you know, I've been, I'm 37, so I've been in security for almost like 12 years. But when I think about uh, kind of the, the direction in which security operations, uh, then overall the defensive side of security is focusing, I mean, uh, focusing or what they're beginning to phase in and phase out. Uh, as I was writing this, the idea of like, you know, John Nash kind of came into mind. And, I, and you know, you can look John Nash up, but essentially the, the, the premise for, for this talk was really structured around game theory, right? So uh, if you imagine a situation where, you know, you have two players and a chosen strategy, but no player benefits from like changing strategies, you know, uh, no player would actually benefit from, from changing strategies you know you'd have to be on the same page in order for both players to essentially find that level of reward right so it's essentially you know you all you stick to the same strategy on both sides or if one side changes it pretty much everyone loses and that's essentially kind of the way that i look at uh what's happening from a uh you know from a SOC perspective uh security operations center so when i say SOC, that's essentially what i mean just to uh just to shorten it uh i spend a decent amount of my time living in uh, the security operations land. It's, I've probably spent 80%, upwards of 80% of like my career working amongst, you know, a huge team, you know. So what is a SOC? Uh, I'll let you read through this yourself, but essentially, you know, uh, if you're looking for the official definition, it's, you know, this the it's a, it's a team that is primarily put together to focus security efforts for against uh, people, processes, and uh, uh, technologies, right? So how do you bring together a group of individuals with various skill sets, and apply them or, or, tar or focus them towards specific challenges for your for your organization. Um, so that's more like the official term. In reality, it's a nut house. Uh, you know, I've had loads of fun uh, kind of working in multiple socks across different uh, vectors and uh, uh, different businesses. You know, and honestly, that's what I attribute to a lot of my a lot of my knowledge uh, is you know working with people that were great with Intel led me to uh, you know pick up an interest in, in uh, cyber threat intelligence and put kind of put that tool in the tool belt right working with people that were great with uh into the uh digital forensics that led me down the ir path right so you start to like surround yourself with these individuals that can do some really awesome uh things really awesome talent and you slowly begin to pick that up right i think you know as for myself i know that's the best that's the best way i learn is kind of by doing it when i'm in a con conducive environment where everyone's kind of pushing and everyone's you know essentially trying to level up themselves and they and they want to tackle really really difficult challenges that's, you know, for me, that's kind of where I thrive. Um, and when I speak about, you know, you know, most in, in most organizations, you know, uh, you will typically find a charter for any IT, any IT operations, right? So if you think about, you know, DevOps or if you think about sysadmin or networking, there's typically some type of charter which essentially consists of their mission statement of how they how they reach their goals and how they make their goals. Uh, I, you know, I'm a, I try to be a simple person. So it, uh, I kind of summarize, you know, the SOX overall uh, focus around uh, monitoring detection and response, right? You know, those are the three pillars at, you know, a very, at a minimum that 
you should uh, you should be focusing upon, especially if you are building out a soccer, you've just been awarded a budget to actually build out, you know, the resources and bring in uh, people and the technology. You know, focusing on three these three areas, if nothing else, will will get you will get you pretty far, right? So, you know, focusing from monitoring side, what 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 is available to me and what am I protecting, right? So, how can I think? What am I? Uh, what can I use for logging? What can I use for identification? How can I tag data resources if I have some type of log correlation tool, a Splunk, Devo? Uh, elastic, you know, whatever it may be. From a detection perspective, you know, it, it sounds just like what it is, right? Ability, your ability to detect, um, you know, how how fast are you? What's your lag time? What's what, what dwell time for attackers? You know, how are you baselining your environments? And then response, you know, response is essentially, you know, what steps are you taking to either kick an attacker out of out of the environment, or maybe it's not necessarily related to you know, what an attacker has done for your response efforts. Maybe it's related to a pen test and you moving through the remediation stages for that. Uh, you know, it can it can vary, but those are the areas that I say, you know, kind of make up this fun nut house called the sock. Um, so where did the sock go wrong? Uh, well, I don't I don't think the sock actually went wrong anywhere. I think we just kind of took our eyes off the ball as security became a much more focal point for companies. You know, you, you go back, you know, 10, 12 years, there really wasn't a huge budget attributed to individuals within security operations or the security program. Uh, over the last, you know, five, six, seven, eight years, you're seeing these these uh, budgets, you know, just balloon up. I have buddies that work at pretty large financial institutions, and it's not uncommon for, you know, a Chase or uh, uh, or a Wells Fargo to have, you know, one or two million dollar budget, you know, for security operations. Right? That's a lot of that's a lot of people. That's a lot of toys that you can essentially buy. But what I think has kind of happened is, you know, as different areas of IT have changed and shift shifted you know, we aren't as tuned in. We aren't as tuned in to DevOps. And often at times uh, when, I've cons when I consult, you see that, you know, application security teams sit outside of the actual SOC, right? So there's not that, there's not that delineation. There's not that line of communication between, you know, what the SOC is working on and what security operations is working on. When you think about, you know, uh, moving towards really staying current with automation, staying current, with moving towards the ability to rapidly scale up, you know, you have to think about DevOps. And, you know, uh, if you're not, you know, one of the things I want to want to take away from this, if you're if you're in security and you're not you, and you're a bit unfamiliar with, you know, DevOps practices, I always recommend to anyone, people I mentor, younger people I, I run across, you know, take some time to really understand that. And DevOps, it, it, it may seem complicated on the surface, but really you break it down into a few different areas, right? You're thinking about, you know, you're thinking about coding. You know the code development and review process. You're thinking about building, so that's you know continuous like integration uh, and, and build status. Thinking about testing. How do you put the first two together uh, to reach a you know a tangible goal? Uh, packaging, refreshing, configuration, like monitoring. These are all areas of like how you how you begin to like package together a specific application when you release it. How you configure it. How the, how the settings are actually configured within. Uh, within that particular application or within that particular instance, and then you know how do you deploy it, how do you monitor it, right? That's about five or six different areas, but those are really kind of the core areas of what makes up uh, DevOps. You know, and like you know, in plain English, it's just you know a process to remove a barrier to rapidly release programs. Um, in order for you know DevOps to be successful, there is a few areas that you know that are. Uh, Kind of heavy hitters in this uh, heavy hitters for in its entirety. So if you you take the DevOps, uh, you take the DevOps uh, goal of you know being able to rapidly release, scale up, scale down, you know, in a much faster time period. Well, how does that get done, right? Uh, and this is essentially where you know DevOps pipelines kind of come into play. Uh, again, keeping it super super simple. You know, think how do you break down you know a DevOps pipeline? You know, uh, and that's you know CI/CD continuous integration and continuous development, right? If you want to make that really really simple, think of it as more like the universal control uh, uh, that you can make within within the within releasing or within packaging within DevOps, uh, uh, SCM or uh, or source content management. That's really just you know uh, trying to avoid like merge conflicts when you when you're releasing code or when you're making new pulls or when you're adding adding deleting whatever you're actually doing. Just ensuring that whatever you change from a modification perspective, you can always recover from it. Uh, think of it as uh, DR, I guess, within DevOps. Um, build automation tools, uh, web application service, uh, and code testing coverages. These are all just other areas that are kind of akin to really solidifying 
uh, solidifying the DevOps process and ensuring that whatever you make can be recovered. You have a you have a regularly deployable uh, schedule. You know what your packages would look like. You understand the interfaces that the interfaces can actually render, and you know this is all manageable and, and trackable. All right. Skip one. Um, this other area that I mentioned that you know uh, there is that kind of that separation essentially is application security. So, uh, so what is application security? I mean, in simple, simple terms, you know, it's there, it's really your ability to statically or dynamically review code uh, from a security perspective. That's a trip. That's a, a part of an application or really a part of a system. Um, you know, from a security. I mean, from a from a defenders or from the C and D side. You know, I say your focus is really on uh, you know why we care and how can we win. Um, you know, as a defender's job, this isn't too different across really any area of uh, security, right? I look at and I, I kind of take the approach as I'm a defender, I'm here, I'm meant to protect. You know, I, if I can protect, monitor, to respond, going back to those three pillars, that's a win at the end of the day for me, right? So one of the bigger things that I've seen from a lot of the, the past couple of years of like consulting and working uh, on different projects is when this sits outside the SOC and you come to, you know, the people in security operations like, hey, tell, give, what, what's going on with your application security program? What type of findings are, are they coming back with from scanning, which we're gonna go into in a bit. And you know the answer is usually I don't know, right? And that's not to fault anyone. It's just that it, we haven't been in a, at a position where it's uh, it's totally integrated into security. So the SOC typically won't have those answers right off the top of their right off the top of their head, right? Like you know, if you think about a traditional vulnerability management program, how is that really any different from incorporating application security and understanding where those vulnerabilities sit, right? That, that's something that you would want to be locked in and focused upon, right? That's something that you'd wanna have an idea of how can I build out the countermeasures and detections against it. Um, and application security is, you know, and, and you know, I didn't, I don't come from an AppSec background. Like I said, I come from a SOC background. The last two or three years, I've begun to think more around AppSec. I think it's honestly like, since I moved to Boston, you know, I, I became friends with like people like, you know, Ori, who's who's, who's uh, uh, running a, a, a workshop client who's really big in, in application security, getting to know a lot of the people at OWASP, starting to go to those things. You really start to like listen to what they're what they're working on from a day to day. And at least from my perspective, I think, well, how can I incorporate that into security operations from a duties perspective and from a monitoring and detection perspective? But, you know, just some quick little, uh, a quick little statistics, you know, around from every year Verizon releases a report, uh, the DBIR report, data breach uh, investigations report. And this is just chock full of useful information. Essentially, if you boil it down, what it really is, is just an annual report of uh, the top vectors that are targeted by attackers and the top techniques that attackers leverage uh, to reach their goals. Um, and some of the findings from last year was, you know, were, you know, kind of astounding in some ways, right? 70% of data breaches caused by external actors. That's not new, but the new one is like, you have organized crime and the mob getting involved with it. 45% of uh, breaches are caused uh, by application are, are, are caused by web applications, uh, vulnerabilities in web applications, right? Like these things are on the rise, you know, and it's kind of it's kind of creepy in a sense. Um, but in, in it also, if you're going to be positive, it also allows us to really take to take a step back and look at reports like that. And as an individual working within the SOC, think how can I tackle some of these areas, right? Um, and when you begin to think about, okay, how can I get involved and how can I tackle that? You really need to understand what's like the crux or, or what essentially is, you know, the makeup uh, of AppSec. And we already went, I've already mentioned that, you know, a part of this is really understanding static and dynamic analysis, but this doesn't mean you, you know, yourself have to have to, have to do this, uh, have to, you know, sit there and go to uh, line by line uh, to analyze code. There's a lot of tools out there, which we'll speak about in a, uh, in a bit, but kind of those primary responsibilities around dynamic, uh, dynamic and static analysis, also incorporating threat modeling. Threat modeling is something that's not totally new to an individual from a security operations perspective. You run this across your networks and systems, or you should be doing this, you know, at least once a year at a very, very minimum, but ideally like, you know, once a quarter or biannually, you know, threat modeling your environment, understand where your ingress and egress points are, what OSs are there, what type of uh, networking equipment is available there? Uh, where do those vulnerabilities sit between those uh, in, against those two areas, right? Uh, you know, it's essentially taking pen test results and uh, really taking effort and, and moving towards being proactive and creating countermeasures from penetration testing results, right? These things aren't totally different uh, uh, on the AppSec side. It's just different types of data and it's structured differently. So, you know, begin to take on the mindset of, well, how could I do this as a defender? 
a lot of the times the things that I hear from individuals, uh, actually the, probably the top one is, well, I don't, you know, I don't code, right? So how the heck do I do that? And, you know, and, and that I, I totally understand that totally valid. Uh, you know, it's a valid question to ask. But, you know, living in what, 2020 right now, there are some really, really awesome tools from a DAS or SAS perspective that kind of help you get where you need to be, right? You know, there's, you know, you have uh, Burp Suite, which has a free version, you know, uh, there's Breaker Man, there's, uh, there's actually Sneak you could use, uh, SNK, that you could actually use to really determine where those vulnerabilities sit from, from an app tech perspective, and then taking that output and attempting to incorporate that within uh, security operations. So you, it helps to code drastically. <laughs> it was, it's, uh, you know, it definitely helps in your day to day, in your day to day aspects. But you can, you can get by without it for a decent amount of time, especially if you have individuals kind of dedicated to AppSec. You can open that line of communication and begin to think, hey, how, what, what more can I do as, uh, as a defender? Uh, so how do we push left? Uh, so we'll just walk through a quick example of kind of what this will look like, right? So here we have an app, nothing really special, uh, just uh, an app in beta for a restaurant that uh, that's been created. When you think about the threat modeling perspective, uh, I'm sorry, nothing. When you think about the threat modeling stages, you know, there's a couple of questions that you'd want to ask yourself of uh, understanding. Hey, well, what type of code runs? Where are uh, uh, when we scan? What type of problems are we worried about? Who leverages this? Is there an API hook into it? You know, what type of data are we storing? You're asking these type of questions from you know, a threat modeling perspective, and then you prioritize, you know, those concerns. Again, taking the same steps you would, you, uh, taking the same steps that are applicable during uh, system and, and networking uh, threat modeling stage, uh, stages, right? Uh, categorize, I mean, uh, categorizing your concerns, uh, you know, and you keep moving down. Okay, great. Now that we understand what we're worried about, how do we begin to act upon it, right? So how do we move into vulnerability uh, detection and actually testing? Again, not too different from what you would actually think about from the attack lifecycle against networking systems. There's a vulnerability, which leads to the exploit, which is likely is a payload that a malicious actor would create, which leads to infection and attack. So you're moving down that chain of trying to reproduce this within the SOC. This goes to like you being Mr. and Mrs. proactive, you know, defender, thinking, okay, well, we've had output from our DAS and SAS people, you know, how do we actually recreate this? Uh, you know, and is this realistic? I mean, yeah, what we're going to show right now is something I just simulated in a lab environment, but it's not its not totally different from what you would want to try in your actual workplace. You know, you go through the stages, you just, you scan initially to identify, you know, your attack vector, to identify uh, the functionality of the application. Here we know, you know, the big thing to walk away with for, the, for this particular uh, simulation is that we know that, you know, uh, the app accepts uploads. It has to take some type of upload for uh, restaurant reviews. You know, you walk through, again, same things you, uh, you, you you think about from vulnerability and penetration testing perspective. You know, you scan, I mean, you understand functionality, you understand your scope, you begin moving into scanning. Uh, from this one, what we did, we just ran a quick static analysis against uh, of against against the application. So a couple of vulnerabilities came back of interest. The directory traversal is a big one that, you know, but, you know, when you look at cross-site scripting, credential management, you know, these are things that as a, a defender, if you're unfamiliar with these terms, OWASP does a ridiculously amazing job of breaking these type of attacks down into super, super uh, simple terminology, uh, which will allow you to take that output and start moving towards incorporating different monitoring and detection tools to build out some type uh, uh, of countermeasure. Um, from a dynamic analysis, a dynamic, dynamic, a dynamic analysis perspective, uh, here's the output from, uh, from the code against uh, against the lab environment, right? So. Nothing too out of the ordinary there, just some um, exploits we're going to attempt to, I mean, vulnerabilities we're going to attempt to run against. Uh, and once you actually have this data, I think this is another area that, uh, I, I think there's a couple of people speaking about this today also, but I think this is another area of like really making that uh, the jump, right? So essentially, okay, we know where the vulnerabilities ex uh, live. We got the scope of the whole application down. Okay, so now what do we do? Uh, and this is where that, gap kind of kicks in within security operations typically what i've what you'll see a lot is like you don't have a group of individuals that are really uh trained or that have have knowledge on moving towards attacking right um you know so what what do we do you know when you have a security program that can attack you hire pen testers right but something i've become acutely aware of over the last like three or four years really is that you don't need 
pen testers for everything, right? Pen testing, uh, pen testers cost money. <laughs> and often there's not too much, too many differences between the reports that they provide you from, uh, from uh, consultancy firm to consultancy firm. Uh, so what I recommend is that, you know, you begin to get familiar with, you know, OPSEC from uh, an attacker's perspective and begin to incorporate and learn about some of the tools that are out there, right? So there's, I don't know the number, but I'm guessing there are hundreds of hours a video for uh, Matt Exploit uh, 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 within YouTube, right? Like I'm, I feel fairly fairly certain of that. Uh, take some time upon yourself to begin to, to really le understand how you leverage those type of tools, right? Uh, going back to our, the previous example, we understand that you know one of the vulnerabilities that was identified uh, from the static and dynamic analysis perspective was you know local file uh, local file inclusion vulnerability. So what this would essentially allow us to do is find a way to not only upload a file of uh, upload a file to the app and but also have the back end essentially executed uh, which gives us a hook in and all we're really looking to determine is like hey can we browse across file paths from within the URL right if we know if we can navigate file paths or bring back directory against I mean uh, directory information from the system then we're a winner okay boom great we have that now so again I'm in a sock I'm thinking okay what more can I do? Um, uh, and, you, and you truly take on the attacker mindset, right? You're thinking, okay, well, if I can get in, uh, you know, maybe none, our alarms haven't went off from our IDS or SIM, whatever, you know, security product you may have in place, let's start pushing a bit deeper to determine what type of logs are available to us after we complete this that we can leverage to create countermeasures, right? If someone begins to move laterally, what are those 400 and 500 or Windows logs that we want to take a look at? Uh, if it's CNC communication or some type of encoding, uh, why do we have these weird, you know, much larger DNS uh, DNS query requests that essentially are pointed to URLs that no one in this environment has hit like ever, right? So you start to kind of move through the stages of this. You know, uh, you, you've attacked it, you have your hook in, now you want to dump some hashes, you grab those hashes, uh, uh, grab those hashes, uh, 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 zip those up, incorporate, I mean, uh, zip those up, encrypt it, and then send it out of the environment, right? Super, super easy. Um, and, and what you should be thinking about while you're doing these type of things and, and learning how to use the offensive side of uh, offensive tools is, you know, where does that connect to, you know, where does that connect to on, on maybe the pyramid of pain? You don't have to reference the pyramid of pain, but I recommend you have some type of framework or some reference that you're working from. So when it's time to sit down with management, you can kind of walk them through the stages of what you reproduce and, and really show value, right? You know, you need to find a way that you can make this measurable, uh, you know, because if you can't measure it, you know, does it really exist? We, you, you may have your own opinion about that, but management definitely has a different opinion considering that they have to report all these things up. Um, and then, you know, again, going back to, you know, thinking about pushing left, incorporating all these different areas of DevOps and, and application security uh, into security operations. So what does that look like uh, from a tooling perspective? You know, again, you have like tools like OWASP SAS and Burp Suite that can help you get there. And if you need to break this down into like really, really simple areas of like phasing this uh, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a staging perspective, again, when I say that, I mean, where am I starting and where am I finishing? Begin to always think about identification. The thing that matters, you know, in my mind, one of the, the biggest matrix in the areas of importance within, uh, within the SOC is the area of identification. So if you can't see it, you know, it doesn't exist, right? So when you complete these type of assessments, you know, going back from leveraging whatever offensive tool it may be, uh, begin to think about, or you should be continuously thinking, where can I identify this? within our tech stack, right? What logs are produced that I could actually gather and hunt for? If they're not actually produced via my current searches or our current our current dashboard, you know, uh, where else should we be looking, right? And this moves into more of thinking about threat hunting. You know, we know we have logs there. We're just not sure what artifacts are present that uh, that lead us to the conclusion of like whether the attack was successful or not. Um, so this goes back to what I said earlier about logging practices, right? Ensuring that monitoring detection are there and that you have solid log of uh, some type of solid log logging practices backing you up because uh, logs will save your life. Um, and again, thinking about pushing left. Again, what other tools can you use to kind of to, to really incorporate this uh, and begin to think about your detection capabilities? So you've moved from you know your identification phase or your identification uh, mission to really logging. Okay, now that we have logging kind of squared away, 
what uh, what other tools can we use to recreate this and actually push those artifacts into more of a detection cap uh, the detection uh, the detection side of the house and also remediation side of the house. Um, you know, and where we understand what to do from a traditional standpoint. I shouldn't say we 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 may have an understanding of, of how this looks from a traditional standpoint of C and D because we've been at this for a long time. But the gap essentially comes in when you have to think about you know do we understand this from a DevOps perspective, right? Do we understand our bills? Do we understand the logs that are output from leveraging Jenkins with AWS CLI and moving towards like Ansible or or, or maybe not even Ansible, but using like Vagrant with Azure or Docker or Packer, like do you think about these other areas of like app, uh, a DevOps that are still fairly new to us that we haven't really begun to think about how to actually pull logs out of there. And there's, you know, a lot of information that's come out over the last two years around leveraging different cloud platforms and, and they're logging, right? It's, it's, a, it's a newer subject and it's still fairly difficult, but things like, uh, 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 you know, AWS with guard duty, uh, you, can, you know, you can still, have a decent amount of detection that comes right out the box, and maybe you don't need to go to directly, you know, uh, tag or define the logs you want, you know, if you're unfamiliar with it, because a lot of that information is readily available to you, right? Um, I don't think you can do a security talk <laughs> lately without mentioning Attack Miter. Uh, you know, I won't go into it on this talk, but something that I recommend is taking a vast amount of the output that you're moving from your purple teaming, uh, incorporating purple teaming and AppSec and DevOps, and begin to identify specific techniques that you believe are, are relevant to your environment. Um, this is a, a bit more easier said than done because I, what I what I tend to see is organizations will grab a tag miter and essentially staple it to the wall and say, "Hey, we want to hit everything, every technique within within uh, within the framework." Right? It's a noble goal, but it's going to take a, low, a, a large amount of resources, uh, and it still doesn't really give you the focus information that where you, where your worries are. Right before you even leverage Attack Miter, this isn't a, a, a Miter talk, but I think before you even leverage that, you need to have an understanding of what your risks are. Right, what are your kind of PRIs or primary requirements for like intelligence if you're leveraging CTI for this type of stuff, but really defining your own risk before you move into that. Uh, and once you define those risks, begin to understand which techniques are applicable against your risk and against your environment and your tech stack. Um, I, that's just a side note, uh, but I do, you know, and maybe this is another talk, but you know, I do believe that when you take this information and you apply it to uh, uh, Attack Miter, you're in a much stronger position to really uh, request and request budget and request people for something like threat hunting, right? So it's not just, hey, I think something's wrong. I want to, I want to start threat hunting 40, 60 percent of my time uh, within a SOC. It's really, it's really taking the time to say, hey, we can link this to this specific technique for this particular threat actor group uh, that's relevant to our specific vector. This is why I want to start threat hunting. You know, taking more of a an adult approach to asking for what you want. Um, and from a remediation perspective, you know, so what does this look like when you're putting you know, like all these things, uh, all these things together. Um, you know, when you I'm, I'm, when you put back on the sock hat and the current uh, the current duties are what exists within the charter. Uh, code fix and patching typically kind of falls outside uh, of the sock, right? User privilege. I, I think you can argue that that's that's within the sock is understanding access rights and, and, and implementing access controls across your environment kind of, you know, that's something that individuals within the SOC would be aware of. But a couple of these areas, you know, outside, I mean, outside the SOC, they're totally separate and, and, and not as useful from a feedback loop, creating that feedback loop. But when you bring those together uh, and you sit all these stakeholders down in a room, uh, you as, you know, an individual that's in charge of security operations or an individual that works within the security operations sphere, um, you begin to have a better understanding of what that truly uh, what that truly looks like, right? From the DevOps and from the AppSec perspective, uh, and from the DevOps perspective of something that you know I've been kind of throwing myself into over the last uh, year and a half is really thinking about you know how do you create you know golden uh, golden images and, and golden uh, pipelines, right? This is something that uh, uh, there's a gentleman named Casey Laxton. He's over at uh, at Toast. He kind of had me thinking about this. He comes from he comes from like more of a DevOps background, but also has a pretty good, uh, a really really good amount of security knowledge. But something that you know that some of the, in our in our uh, conversations in our interactions, you know, something that I begin to become very very curious about is like from a security perspective, how can I understand when uh, there's a new image that is that's uh, a new image that 
is, will be deployed across the environment that's been tagged. You know, how do we really begin to understand, you know, uh, levels of like patch uh, levels of patches there, uh, what vulnerabilities may exist within the, within uh, that specific image? Like, how do we begin to think about, you know, hardening, uh, hardening against that specific image, right? Like, so how do you begin to move towards creating this, you know, this uh, this golden image, right? So if anything, not anything, but if certain uh, uh, certain if, if specific uh, items are out of place, whether that's a patch, whether that's a specific level of a vulnerability, uh, a vulnerability management, then you essentially, you know, you you allow that build to break, right? You go back to zero. So instead of having individuals essentially uploading or deploying vulnerable code uh, or dependencies that have vulnerabilities that exist with them, with exist within them, you you you, you uh, instead of pulling, you go back to zero, and then they have to remediate that before they can actually push out the environment and make those PRs. Um, it, it's something that it, it's just a really really cool mindset. I'm super happy that uh, that I actually met Casey because it has me thinking like totally different around you know what I should be worried about as a defender. And then and you, I know when you still in the mindset of you know you know pushing left right. Do you understand how the micro containers work within your environment and how that incorporates or, or how you incorporate vulnerability management into that? Uh, are you defining, you know, VPC, uh, correct VPCs and IAM policies within, uh, within AWS or, you know, within other uh, cloud providers? And there's tools out there that can, you know, definitely help you uh, accomplish this. Uh, Anchor and Claire are pretty good tools for vulnerability, uh, the vulnerability assessment side of things, just for specifically within uh, your automation tools. Uh, I believe Anchor's still free uh, up, up until a certain point. Um, so what does this look like, right? So again, me, guy, or person in the SOC, I'm thinking about, you know, how can I incorporate security practices into uh, the DevOps pipeline and really DevOps lifecycle? Uh, and what I, how I kind of see this working you know, I, I welcome you and want to challenge me on it, but you begin to incorporate security here, incorporate security into uh, the DevOps side of things. Really, this is goes back to almost like the the kind of the basics of SDLC, right? Uh, you're looking to determine if something is out of place or if something opens up a specific risk or a specific vulnerability, then you need to like essentially break that bill, right? So if you have micro containers and you're trying to take on the golden pipeline or golden image, uh, uh, perspective of security or enforcement. I guess enforcement is a better role, a better word. Enforcement of security. Uh, you know, you then have to really understand from a repo manager perspective, from a micro containers perspective. You know, what all those what uh, what are the VPCs that's likely going to call out to? Um, what uh, are there? Have we appropriately scanned this specific repo to understand? Are there like any hard coded uh, tokens available? Right, like a huge portion of like going back to the DVIR report. If you look at that, I think it was 43 or 45 percent number uh, attacks that uh, began from a web app. I mean, breaches that led that breaches that originated from a web application security perspective. There is a decent percentage of those where literally all the all the attackers had to do was scan across Git and look for credentials with encode and then turn around and leverage those. Right. Like this isn't the most. You know, so these, this isn't the most sophisticated, you know, attack in the world. It's just really taking some time to scrape GitHub, right? And and you'd be surprised how often this actually works. I mean, luckily there's tools out there that can kind of help developers avoid avoid this mistake. But it sounds simple, but it, you know, it's it, it's a surprising it's surprising how often that that type of attack is successful of just scanning across repos to actually look for credentials. Um, but you know, go moving down the development pipe. Uh, that, uh, uh, the DevOps pipeline, you know, you should be in this, you want to ideally find yourself in a position where you can really think about, you know, what is in place right before that PR, right? Or right before that deploy to uh, the deployment into a cloud environment. How can I create those checks and balances to understand uh, from a security perspective, speaking solely from security, but to understand where, you know, areas within our risk register or areas that we're concerned about from a vulnerability management perspective, from a data access perspective, from a rights perspective, anything along those lines. How can we bake that into the DevOps pipes, uh, the DevOps uh, lifecycle, and really create those blockers so we can avoid, you know, essentially ending up in the news or essentially ending up on some blog, right? And then if, this is not to say that um, it, it, it's easy. It definitely isn't. You know, it takes a, a huge amount of time to kind of get these things under your belt, but really starting to think about, you know, okay, if I'm dev to QA, 
Supreme Pfizer of production, you know, what happens if, you know, an, an, an issue is identified in pre you know, whether that's like exposed creds or something along those lines. It should be an automatic blocker that breaks the bill, forces them to go back to zero. And I mean this in the nicest way because we're all trying to win here, but forces them to, forces them to go back to zero uh, before they, uh, before, the you know, any internal and external data are essentially put at risk. Um, you know, and, you know, again, kind of closing out around how we actually do this. Uh, the one thing that I think is the, I won't say it's the easiest path forward, it's the best path forward, is really taking the time to sit down with development teams of, of AppSec and also DevOps, I mean, uh, and beginning to kind of build out more of a security champions program. Um, it's, in, it's, it's really difficult to try to incorporate all these things that we just spoke about on your own as as a as, as a member of the SOC or as a member of, of, of the security team. You're gonna need you know loads of communication, uh loads of resources to, to essentially help you uh build out this type of program. And and you know it does take a lot more of the human effort. This isn't really hands-on keyboard work. This is just you know good old fashioned interpersonal communications and taking the time to actually sit down with individuals within your corporate uh within your organization and really ask them questions around how uh, how you can actually uh, improve, how they can help you improve security, but also how you can help them uh, avoid any potential problems uh, at the end of the line, right? Uh, yeah, so in conclusion, uh, you know, a couple of things that, you know, I recommend is really one, you know, as a as a member of the SOC, begin to adjust your, uh, the, the, the charter uh, to incorporate AppSec practices within the org. Uh, definitely go out, get involved uh, with DevOps. You know, some of the tools that I covered here today are, are all open source. Um, maybe just trying those out in a lab environment. If you don't have, if you don't have the capability to 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 try this out, you know, at home. I mean, I'm sorry, at work. Uh, give it a shot at home. You know, figure out a way to kind of loop yourself into a continuous learning uh, cycle. So. You're always, you know, not always, but you have a pretty good idea of how to leverage these. And it's not, you're not in the situation where you have to try these tools out in a bind or in a pinch or doing, uh, or doing an incident response engagement. Like you want to kind of have an idea of how to leverage some of uh, the attacking tools, uh, you know, well before uh, something actually goes wrong. You want to have an idea of like, how do I leverage uh, some of the development tools, right? I, I recommend shadowing individuals within DevOps. Uh, it's something that's honestly worked for me, sitting down with individuals and understanding what our deployment looks like, how we actually leverage, whether it's tangible, whether it's Chef, whatever, like what do those recipes look like within Chef, right? What the heck is a recipe? Uh, in, in Chef, that's just, you know, the code that actually makes up the deployment, you know? So really understanding what that looks like and asking questions, you know, something uh, I tend to kind of live by is like learn to be okay with temporary ignorance. You know, it's not, it's not as if you were born. The best example I can think of is not as if you were born walking right out the room. Right, you had to. You you were born. You had to crawl around for a bit on your stomach, your back, whatever. Kick your legs, and eventually, you know, you stood up right and you begin to walk right. But as that infant and as that child, you were essentially ignorant to, to walking. You didn't understand that. You know, over time, you begin to learn that. Uh, so kind of take that team approach to. I mean, not only security but different areas in life. You know, learn to be okay with temporary ignorance. Temporary is a key word here. It's going to take you some time if you don't understand these areas to learn. So begin to sit down with individuals within your org, uh, shadowing them. Take some time on your own to study up uh, on different areas of de uh, DevOps and AppSec. Uh, and then when you come to work, don't be afraid to over communicate. Uh, it's you know it's always better to over to go over than under, right? You want to understand as much as possible because you as uh, an individual on on the within the security program or within the SOC it kind of falls on you when things go wrong, right? The first thought, a lot of times within the organization, if there's any type of outage, it isn't, you know, I think we're past the days of like, oh wait, is this something with our code? The, the, uh, maybe, I don't know. But the first thought is typically, crap, we're being, ha we're being hacked, we're being attacked, it's something with security, get those guys on the line. You know, so, you know, begin to like, understand who you're working with and who your counterparts are well before uh, that, stage uh, that that activity occurs uh, but you're not at the stage of trying to hunt down different individuals that are responsible for different aspects of, the, of, of IT development or administration. Um, over communicate is always uh, a better path to take.
Uh, and that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can email me. Uh, you can find me on Twitter uh, at Sir Webblood, uh, and we'll take some questions now. Awesome. Thanks, O'Shea. Let's take a look at Discord. I think uh, there was only one question on what pushing left meant, and it was answered. Um, basically, just detecting issues earlier in the SDLC process phases. Um, do you have anything else you want to add to that? Um, yeah, I mean, so uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, when I began to kind of ask that question myself, something that became apparent to me, and it was kind of a premise of like, uh, not this talk, but just some work I did uh, last year, was thinking, how do I reflect that within security operations and with, within our tools, right? So a good example is like, you know, whether you use Splunk or you're using, you know, uh, Elastic, Devo, whatever, whatever uh, uh, log correlating tool you, that you're leveraging, um, you know, with from how can you show, how can you actually prove that you your SDLC your SDLC practices are being fed into security operations, right? And there, there norm, there's no, uh, there's not really a plugin for that within a lot of the the correlation tools, right? You kind of have to build this out from scratch. You kind of have to understand, okay, well let's make a specific search around uh, these type of API calls within our environment to this particular part of the application and, and understand what that what is normal there, right? Uh, who's, who, who are the top requesters there? Uh, what region of the world is that coming from? Uh, and let, maybe let's add that with uh, HTTP status code, right? Understanding, you know, okay, well, what's the, what is the average of number like 404s we see or maybe 300s against uh, results from these API calls? Um, you have to like take what's essentially given of the or really the, the 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 genesis of what SCLC is and apply that going back to the security operations side to those three pillars of monitoring, detection, and response, and really thinking how do I how do I prove it, right? Like if someone were to ask me, uh, me as an analyst, you know, how secure is the application, or do you understand normal activity against it, and the answer is no, then I would say maybe SCLC isn't like as effective as it potentially could be from a security operations perspective, because you're not totally looped into that. It's not your day to day uh, to sit there and, and ship through code. You know, your day to day is really understanding the logging and the output and leveraging different tools to correlate that. So how do you build out, you know, really solid output from SDLC into, you know, your logging practices, right? Awesome. Uh... Thanks for that answer. Uh, another question from, I think it's Austonian B, is how do you think the SOC AppSec slash dev feedback loop should be sustained? Are you suggesting that the SOC and others use a common framework or common issue tracking system to keep everyone on the same page or path? That's a good question. So one, uh, I'd say that first step of that is really creating that uh creating that security champions uh program uh you know sitting down with those individuals at a minimum once a month uh to walk through uh events that have occurred of uh, something i did in the past was like we would sit down with our application team and we would bring up uh, some of the top cases from an ir perspective whether that was the previous month or maybe the previous 60 days uh, and we would essentially kind of look at the top uh the, the top of uh, events that they had Anything that led to like an outage or anything that kicked off uh, the security, I mean, the, uh, the the development team's IR cycle. Um, and we begin to kind of compare notes and then really begin to understand like, okay, what is the form of escalation or what is our, uh, our procedure of shifting things from application team into security operations, right? So what's like a checklist that op the application team runs through to understand that, hey, this isn't necessarily an issue with, uh, with an issue with the code or the configuration, this seems to be something for, uh, of an external factor. And how do we, you know, uh, open this ticket and shift it over to security operations so they can further investigate? I mean, you kind of have to walk. You kind of have to walk through these. But from that feedback loop, I think there has to be like a level of of essentially uh, requirement uh, before you actually start, you know, tossing tickets like over the fence, right? So application team does X Y Z within their checklist of uh, when they have an outage or they have uh, uh, some type of some type of error occurs, uh, and then you know from that from that checklist being completed, they are able to either escalate or transition that over to security operations. Security operations has essentially the same thing, right? Like we reviewed X Y Z logs, we have uh, compared that against the output from 
all these different tools that we may have that are within uh, the security uh, program. Uh, here, here's our output, right? And you know, you're continuously uh, continuously rediscovering this, or re uh, not rediscovering, but uh, sharing this and revisiting this to really understand where those gaps kind of exist from you know, from a DevOps side to an application security side to a SOC side, right? Like you need to first set kind of expectations and goals and then find a way to track it. You know, Jira is great for that. Uh, and then from the tracking perspective, ensure that, that you ensure that you, at the end of the day, there's some variant uh, of lessons learned that's available. So you can go back and revisit everything that's taking place and really look for, you know, spots where you can clean this up or get better. Awesome, great. Uh, another question came in. This was from Thomas K. Sec, uh, with I believe they're with Times, one of our sponsors. Um, they said, I like your suggestion for postmortems. It gets a lot of the visibility plus chat and gets folks on the same page, but it feels it still feels like a lot of socks are overwhelmed with the alerts and are struggling to stay afloat. So it's really hard to persuade management slash CISO to get more resources. Are there any other recommendations to, to persuade management that we need to shift left and get more resources. Yeah, I think you have to, you really have to prove it first. Like the, I'll give you an example. Like when I, cause I faced a similar problem around uh, budgeting. Uh, so the concern was like, how do we know that this is like a legitimate problem? Uh, so what I had to do, it's not too dissimilar from the answer I gave a second ago. I had to sit down with uh, our application team and really begin to understand from uh, from let's just say the standard logs within guard duty, right? Like what are some of those standard logs uh, from against like SQL injections or like uh, some of the OWASP top 10 and really understanding, hey, did any of this activity actually seep through, right? Did any of this make it to uh, any internal systems? Uh, you, have, you have to find yourself or really, you have to force this in reality, but you kind of have to uh, find yourself in a position where you can uh, take output from uh, from development teams, whether that's, you know, creating some type of, uh, of search or report within Datadog specifically for security or within Splunk for security, uh, and then begin to leverage that against activity for the last 30, 60, 90 days, whatever it may be from security perspective, and, and begin to find those holes, right? You know, you want to understand that like, hey, we see the start point from this specific IP at this specific time with these specific status code, with this specific API call and this specific result. And some of this activity is, linked or is similar to information we may have from you know a threat intelligence vendor right like this act this type of uh, activity is similar here so maybe it's something where we need to dive a bit deeper because it could be an indicator of a malicious actor attempting to poke around or find weaknesses within our uh weaknesses within the app and with our within our systems you know this you know i i wish there was an easier way to do this but a lot of it really is sitting down and talking to them, you know, bringing your guns to the fight, you know, bringing your detection capabilities and your logging and comparing against their, what they have and looking for those areas of correlation. Great, that's a great answer. Um, let's see, the, there's no additional questions right now, but there might be some more coming in. So um, let's see. So Ash20 said, um, there's still a little bit of confusion on what shift left is. Is it um, left side of a chart or process, a quadrant? Uh, I, I guess just a little bit more quadrant. clarification on what, uh, that, what that means. Yeah, it, it's so really shift and left is something that came out of uh, uh, security development lifecycle, right? It's something that came out of SDLC and it's incorporated in security into uh, the earlier stages of development. Um, in its simplest term, it's really you know, incorporating security into the early stages of development. But the the gap essentially is, uh, at least that I found, is you don't typically have security operations uh, a part of that, right? Like that usually lies either with AppSec that's, that may sit outside of the, app, the security program, or let's say there is an, uh, a security application uh, security application program. Though, uh, those responsibilities and those uh, those duties uh, that that make up uh, shifting left from code requirements to secure code practices, all those different things are kind of handled internally with the application team and with the dev team. So what happens is maybe they are following best practices put for put forth by OWASP or any or any other or any of the other bodies, but as uh, a member of security, you're not totally included into that. 
So when things go wrong, you're bought in at the at the end of at the end of the stick, right? You're bought in after there's been an attack or after there's been a breach, and you're kind of and then you're forced to sit down with these individuals to understand, like, hey, how does this app work? Okay, cool. Well, have you guys had any vulnerabilities before? Oh, that would have been great to know like a month ago, right? So you you find yourself at the latter end of it versus being kind of looped in at the very beginning. Hopefully that clarifies it.